what's up everybody welcome back to my channel i'm so excited today because we have a great topic um, that's really affecting us now with this covid 19 pandemic i have a wonderful person that is joining me today her name is may jean uh placid and just to give you a quick background about her she um she usually likes to go by her nickname mj so i will be referring to her as mj and she uh, received her bachelor's and master's degree from um, Messiah University, which was formerly called um, Messiah College. And she graduated her with her bachelor's um, majoring in biopsychology and received her master's of OT in 2019. It actually took her three attempts to pass her MBCOT exam, but that is so, so many people are going through that. And that is not something mm -hmm. that is like off odd or unusual. So she's going to be talking a little bit about that. And she also graduated in June of 2020. So I'm sorry, she took her exam in June, June of 2020. And then she started working in August. So she's going to talk about her transition from just being in school, where everything used to be normal for us and now being in the pandemic. So I'm so excited that you are here with us, MJ. Welcome to my channel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tamisha. It's so exciting to be here. Um, you know, I just, again, want to thank you for this opportunity um, to really just explain uh, my experience, um, just everything. So, and, and hopefully, you know, it can help somebody. I, I really enjoy your channel and just some of the tips that you had. I wish I discovered you in school. <laughs> I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> like, Oh, she has some oh. great stuff. So well, I really appreciate you bringing me on. I've been I've been so much more active these days because you know now that now that you're at home and you have a little bit more time, you know I'm able to do a little bit more. But before life is so much more hectic, having to right. work and come home and take care of an infant. So yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Yeah. So usually when I have people on the channel, I always ask them the first question. And the first question is always, what made you decide to become an OT? And I'm going to ask you specifically, what made you decide to become an OTR versus a CODA? Yeah, so uh, to answer the first question, um, I knew I wanted to do something in the medical field. Um, you know, my mom was a nurse um, and she also is a seamstress. She, she sews, she's a fashion designer, and my dad's like engineering. So I didn't really get the engineering brain, but I knew I wanted to do something where I was helping people, um, really inspired by my parents and how they help people too. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I was looking just really through the different types of medical professions, and it always seemed like the ones I was looking, I'm like, ah, oh, like, I like that, but not quite, you know, I want to merge my love of teaching and helping others. And, um, you know, anatomy, I want to also empower people. And then I, I came across occupational therapy. Mm -hmm. um, I'm like, oh, what's that, you know, and I, I just saw how the profession really just looked at people holistically. Um, yeah. not just the physical impairments, um, but goes beyond that and, you know, has the teaching empowering elements. I'm like, oh, yes, like, this is it. Um, so since then, I think I discovered it, uh, it was freshman or, or sophomore year of high school. And I'm like, all right, I definitely want to do this. Now, yeah. when I chose to do OT, I actually didn't know about the CODA position okay. until way later on. Um, but it I still decided to keep the OTR track because, and correct me if I'm wrong about this, I believe the, for, to be a CODA is, is getting the associates. And I'm not sure if they, they changed that. Um, if it has to be a bachelor's now. Um, Actually, you know what, you're right. It's, it's still associates, but they are leaning towards um, a bachelor's degree. Um, yeah. I know when I was in school, I just, I went ahead and did the BS and, you know, I just decided I was actually going for the OTR and I was uh -huh. like, you know what? Cause I was already working as a CODA and I was like, you know what? Once I got into the bachelor's and I finished the bachelor's and I was getting ready to go into the master's, I was like, well, you know what? I actually like being right. a CODA. Like, 
I don't yeah. have to do with all the extra paperwork and I just get to focus on treatment. So for yeah. me with that route, it was, it was, you know, I got to see what the life was before I decided to move further. But, right. and I think it's really great that you became an OTR because what I'm noticing now too, in like the times we're living, you have a lot of options mm-hmm. um, compared with CODAs. We're a little bit more limited on what we can do. Um, and as you know, with your supervision, like we need you guys, we can't really work without you for the yeah, moment. Same part, here, <laughs> you know, um, but I mean, that's a great, that's a great story. I mean, I'm impressed that you figured it out in high school that you want to be an OT. Um, I know it took me a while to decide. So, you know, what, what kind of give you that light bulb moment? Like, did you see like, like an article? Did you meet somebody? How did you come that's- up with that? Honestly, that's the thing. I really feel like my story is so unoriginal because, you know, I've met um, classmates or other people who, you know, had a personal encounter with an OT or, um, you know, knew someone or family member who had an OT and that's what really sparked their um, inspiration uh, to be one. But for me, it really was like Googling search, Google searching, you know, <laughs> different professions until I'm like, it, it checked off all my boxes. Um, I think really the only thing I didn't, wasn't a fan of was like the documentation, but like every job, you know, has yeah. office work. So right. once I got over that, I'm like, you know, this is it. Um, right. Yeah, that's, that's pretty much, you know, it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And you seem like you have a great personality. So, you know, being a, being an OT, you really got to have a good personality because you're dealing with so many different um, people, you know? Right. So let me ask you, so how was field work for you? Because I know so many, um, you know, new students, newbies that's that's getting ready to start and they're going into Mm -hmm. their field work is really nervous. How was field work um, for you when you were starting that? Yeah, so uh, in my program, uh, the last six months of the program is field work, level two field works. Um, We had two and they were three months each. Mm -hmm. So the first one I had was at a private practice. And the second one I had was at a SNF facility, skilled nursing facility. Um, So at the private practice, uh, it was, it was really cool in a sense of what I got to see and experience. Um, and I feel, felt like that experience even helped me into the next setting in some ways. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, the private practice, it was co- it's called Reliance Therapy in Middletown, PA. And, and the supervisor that's there, the OT that's there, um, she's a seasoned therapist. So she's like 30 plus years under her belt. So I was like right away like, okay, yeah, I'm going to like suck as much knowledge as I can from this woman. <laughs> right, right. Um, and uh, she has a certification in hand therapy. Um, and so with her practice, she treats people from all across the ages. She treats kids, she treats adults. Um, uh, so I got to be exposed to some uh, hand therapy, some hand patients. That's um, great the modalities, what to use with them, a little bit of splinting too. So that was really great, especially for NBCOT stuff. (laughs) Um, And then what was also unique about her practice is that she also was sort of like a mobile therapist where she um, went to students' homes who were uh, cyber cyber kids, PA cyber kids, and um, really just helped them we, you know, I got to help them with different interventions. So students that ha- are on like the ASD spectrum, sensory processing disorders, um, visual motor deficits, intellectual disabilities, mm-hmm. um, who needed help with schooling, you know, that's their occupation. So it was really unique coming up with interventions and helping them with handwriting, helping them with their visual motor skills, um, really introduced me to just how wide OT could be. Yeah. And I, my heart is like in the geriatrics, but having that background, even just that little background in PEDS, I realized really helps um, going into the geriatric setting. Yeah. So the SNF facility, now that I finished, you know, once I finished that one, yeah. you know, I, I go into the SNF facility and of course it's, it's kind of different, right? Because, um, you know, in the private practice, my supervisor, she really, 
got to hone in like individualized care, yeah. um, you know, so that was really great. Now at a sniff, you know, you, you got this caseload, it's point of service documentation. So coming in, I'm, I'm learning more about like the facility and the protocols. Um, yeah. You know, work, like working with an interdisciplinary team, like that was like, you know, kind of new. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> coming yeah. from a private practice. Yeah, it's, now, that. it's not that one-on-one. Now you have a group of people yep. that you're working with. So yeah, yeah so a totally different dynamic, but you, that's yeah. that, you know, exposed to that kind of uh, setting. So that's really yeah. great. Wow. Yeah, thank you. It, it definitely wasn't easy, you know, documentation in both settings. It, it's just something like you get, you got to get used to, but you don't always feel comfortable in, especially as a student, because, you know, you're trying to like, you know, get the right verbiage, also sound professional, but also, you know, learning how to like phrase things that flow. So it's all these like things you're learning in school, like, you know, now you're putting together. Um, so it was a challenge. It was, you know, staying up with the documentation, um, you know, and, and working as a team, you know, especially in a SNF setting, um, you know, seeing that structure and that like continuum of care yeah. um, at a facility setting and even just being exposed more to like how things are run. <laughs> yeah. Right. And, you know, what would be your tips uh, for someone that is on their last field work and from, from, I would say tips from transitioning from field work and then after graduation, the expectancy and how that was when you actually now, instead of being a student where you had that kind of umbrella of your um your supervisor the clinical mm-hmm. supervisor now going into a setting where people are, are looking for you for direction so yep. you kind of like guide me through like how that was and giving a couple of tips for students that are actually going into that field work and then yeah you know, transitioning where now you're out there in the world and you're working right yeah i know this sounds like a cliche because i heard it a lot but <laughs> really it's so true the confidence you you definitely need that confidence um so i think because you know when you're a student you you do have your supervisor like even if you're treating you know patients alone in your room and you know they're in the building um at the end of the day like again the doctor's gonna talk to the supervisor but when you're not a student anymore doctor's looking at you you know the nurse is looking at you the pt is looking at you the aide is looking at you um, and I never realized, uh, I took for granted how much field work really did prepare me because I'm like, wait, you know, like I, I did experience this. Like I, I have done this work, you know, mm-hmm. no, I'm not a seasoned therapist, but right. you know, I, I had this, this counts as experience, um, yeah. going in my first job as a new grad. So, you know, that confidence, like, you know, the material just, just, you know the things, just say it. I regurgitate it. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Like it's in yeah. you, now get it out. <laughs> so, right, right. Um, so that I would definitely say confidence. Um, have a notepad at like a I have a clipboard. Okay. You know, no one on the first day is gonna like tell you like, oh, like, you know, here's your clipboard and and here's the things that your common diagnoses you'll see or you know, common interventions or, or things you might wanna, you know, have. Like, you know, <laughs> it's a lot yeah. of learning on the go sometimes. So I definitely would think the prep work um, will save you time and like, you know, some of that anxiety you might feel, some of those jitters that you might feel on the first couple of days on the job. You know, just like have the things that like you used to do, like on your field work. Like, oh, yeah, you know, the hip precautions or like, you know, some uh, safety precautions or wheelchair stuff, um, measurements, whatever. Um, yeah. notes that, you know, like you just like, like a quick sheet. Yeah, yeah, like, exactly. Like, like a mini cook sheet. Yeah. There yeah. you go. Something just to reference and as, you know, just as many little encouragements, you know, you can think of. <laughs> yeah. And I like the fact that you said confidence because when, when you're coming into a facility and there's other therapists around, it's kind of like we can sniff it out. We are like, all right, don't be nervous. It's so bad. Right. Yeah. <laughs> You know, so that's great that the first thing you said was confidence. Yeah. So what's the, what would you say, um, just backtracking a little bit, what would you say your expectation was before you graduated? 
let's let's talk a little let's go back a little oh yeah <laughs> um so when you were still a student what was that expectation of um you know life being a therapist i know for me i was just like oh the world is big and i said right. you know i'm gonna get out there and i'm gonna do my thing and then when no. i get there i'm like oh i gotta take a seat <laughs> I got to take a seat. I got to learn something. So how was, how was the expectation for you when you were still preparing for that transition, getting ready for MBCOT exam? How, what was the mindset? So I definitely thought like in an academic setting, things would be linear. You know, you take this class to get this class, you know, you get this degree to get the next degree. So in my head, my expectations were after I graduated, you know, I'll pass the test, the first try, because who doesn't think that, <laughs> you know, or um, me in the meantime, I'll get my temp license and, mm-hmm. you know, whatever, if it's before I pass, you know, I'll, I'll like get a job or at least like get some interviews or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, all that stuff. And sometimes I learned like life just kind of goes like this still. <laughs> right. um, so when I, when I didn't pass the first time, it was just sort of like rerouting, like, okay, like my hopes of becoming a licensed OT is a little bit stalled right now. What do I got to do, you know, to keep going? Um, So I definitely feel like it's it's still good to have expectations. You know, I I still expected to have my license. I still expected to get a job and those things happened. Um, They just didn't happen right away, like I thought. But um, I, I think, you know, just just keep, keep it, making sure like, you know, um, you, you just try your best. I really just like, all right, I need to buckle down and maybe yeah. get this part time job in, in the meantime. Um, maybe that's like uh, volunteering or, um, you know, still applying for jobs, um, even though I didn't pass the first time and kind of like pitching that like uh, temp license idea. Um, mm-hmm. Some jobs go for it, you know, some jobs don't, but it, mm-hmm. you know, you're still working on your resume. It's, it's still all the grunt work that you would have to do anyways. Um, so how did you change your study techniques to kind of get you to that passing point? Cause I know that's a big question from a lot of students is what are you doing different to kind of change the outcome? Yeah. Yeah. So the, I'll, I'll break it down to, the many times I took the test <laughs> the first okay. time. Uh, so I graduated in August uh, 2019, um, took a little mini vacation, and then September, whole month of September, a little bit in October, I like studied. It was really strict. I studied for like, it was like 40-ish days. Um, so Monday through Friday, I would go to a library, uh, study for like six, seven-ish hours. It was like a full-time job for me. Wow. Um, and then... Uh, would take practice tests on Saturdays. It was really just focused on content. And then I knew I had testing fatigue and for a four hour test, like you want to make sure you have good yeah. stamina. So yeah. I was building that the first time I took it. Um, but, and I only really used like one study material and then towards the end of my studying and like got another one. Um, so when I didn't pass the first time, I thought, well, maybe it was just because I didn't go through enough t- content. Like I wasn't that far off. Mm-hmm. Um, so the second time, you know, still studied pretty vigorously. Um, this was like about like 30-ish days, like a, a month. So it was shorter, but still studying like several hours a day. Like I was just trying to like go really ham. Mm. It's been very content driven. When I took it the second time, I only increased my score by two points. So that was when I just like put my hands up and was like, this is never going to happen. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) yeah, yeah. You know, because the second time I got more study materials, more, you know, I'm taking more practice, that's all this other stuff. And I'm like, for me to only increase by two points, like something's going, like, am I, what is going on? And Yeah. So that third time, what really changed was not just focusing on the content, but focusing on how to answer the question. Right. Um, so by this time, it's like, the, I found out I didn't pass the second time in December. Mm-hmm. I didn't start really studying until like 
January ish. Um, and my mentor, she kind of took me under her wing again. And she was like, I'm going to help you because you're going to get this. So she really helped me dissect how to answer the question. Mm -hmm. And I was still doing my part, studying the content, making sure I refresh those things. I also asked my professors for help. That was another thing. I didn't really ask for help the first two times. So mm -hmm. people who are taking the test, like get your pride out the way. <laughs> if you need right. help, ask for it. <laughs> okay. Right. Uh, Cause it'll cost you money and time. So right. uh, the third time around I'm asking professors and having one-on-one -on -one sessions, sometimes group sessions with past students um, or, you know, students in the cohort uh, go again, going over questions, dissecting the question, seeing what the question is really asking. And then also what really helped was I, I decreased my time studying, like I was studying four-ish hours a day over a longer period of time, but I also studied with someone else. Mm -hmm. um, so depending on what type of person you are, that's beneficial. For me, it was beneficial because I was able to talk out the things out loud, the concepts, the things you just got to memorize the, mm -hmm. you know, the models, whatever, um, really just talking it through because it, when I was studying the first two times, I was just alone in a quiet library. It was not like I'm talking out loud. So I'm just like, you know, the information's there, but I'm just reading it. I'm not really active with my yeah. studying. Yeah. So that being, becoming more active in the studying and also not just focusing on content, but how to read a question yeah. I mean, that's really why I passed. My score increased 30 points and I passed. Yeah. So I'm like, had I maybe focused, you know, on content and how to answer the question just as vigorously, yeah. you know, I probably could have entered like such a, a way higher score, but it, that don't matter. <laughs> so. And you know, I off, and I offer tutoring. And one of the biggest thing that I tell people is you have to, you have to try your best not to just focus on memorizing the information, but you have to learn how to be a critical thinker. Cause a lot of these yes. questions is going to challenge your critical thinking. Now you do need to have content. You need, need you need right. to have a general understanding of all the spectrums, but for the most part, it really comes down to reading the question for the question yeah. and not creating your own question in your mind of what it could be or what it should be or what it might be yeah. or saying this. And I think it's oh, like read gosh. the question for what it's asking you and, yeah. and pull out those key, there's little key words that you got to pull out. And I always yeah. tell, I always tell like my, um, my, my, um, you know, the people that have tutoring, I said, you know, when you first start out, you want to read the question just a regular way. Then mm -hmm. you go back and you read it again, but you read it again very slowly. Yes. And I was a very fast, like, I'd just be like, Brr, and my mentor's like, whoa, like, are you even reading? The, like, you're just flying through because I'm like, oh, no, like, I'm not going to have enough time for the test. Like, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, and, you know, that's, and that's, that's the thing that, that, I think mess up a lot of people is looking at that clock and, cre and creating an anxiety for yourself. Yeah. And I tell people the important part is also breathing, like actually <laughs> taking this, like sitting back and going makes such yeah. a difference. It really does. Yes. So yeah. that is, that's pretty. And I, I'm so happy that you said, you know, you figured out how to answer the question. Cause I think a lot of people run into that. Um, mm -hmm. I think that's one of the biggest challenges that people come into is it's like, I just don't know how to answer the question. So that was great. Right. That you jumped that many points. So that, that tells you right there that something is definitely working. Mm -hmm. um, so let me ask you this. Um, how long did it take you to get your license? And once you got your license and you started working, what, what has changed now since we are now in this COVID pandemic? Because I know before when you were doing your field work, everything was good. People were able to be together. But yeah. how, how has it changed from when you were doing your clinicals and field work, the process of getting your license and now actually working in these two different settings? Because I know you said you're doing teletherapy for pediatrics mm -hmm. and you're also working in the skilled nursing facility where you're actually going in. So mm -hmm. uh, take me through how that dynamic is now for you. Yeah, so uh, starting with the licensure, so uh, towards the end of the program, 
uh, one of the professors, one of our classes, we had to uh, look at what the state that we wanted to be practicing in, uh, what they required, which is really great. And I really advise anyone to do, um, if, it, if that's not incorporated in the program, to see what types of clearances and information or documents that your state needs, because every state is different, how much money it will cost for that. Um, and also just like pretty much you know, gathering the info and stuff that you need, um, because that takes time. Uh, So once you have all of that, uh, once I had all of that, um, you know, just submitting the application in and whatnot, and then once you graduate, it really took about a month. Yeah, uh, yeah, about a month uh, to get my temp license. So while I was studying for the first time for the test, um, like late September, October, that's when I got my temp license. Uh, for the state of PA. So, uh, and I was also kind of emailing them back and forth or calling them, uh, you know, just kind of inquiring like where they were in the process and stuff Mm -hmm. um, because it does take time. But yeah, so I got the temp license and, you know, even just fast forwarding to when I did pass that third time, you know, I got, once I had submitted my NBCOT stuff like hey I pass and even email them like hey I pass <laughs> like yeah. how long will you know the license uh take they were like two two to three weeks and it got in like got in the mail in about like a week and a half so I think that like yeah so I think even like I mean I don't know if it was because of the pandemic or you know they, they were just hustling whatever but wow. um I I really think it was just helpful that I did all that work prior like you know, so that way, once I did pass, it was just like literally submitting the scores and that was it. Wow. So once I passed, um, applied a job, it took about, uh, yeah, like two months uh, for me to get employed. Um, and it, it was different. You know, I didn't have to worry about all the PPE I had to put on before seeing a patient. You know, you just go in right. <laughs> or coming up with a uh, more creative things to do now that treatment is in the rooms because sometimes the therapy gyms will be closed, you know, because of, you know, limiting spread. Um, So it just, it really was an adjustment. Um, You know, at, at times I thought like, Oh, like this is completely new, but it it really, you know, it it wasn't once I kind of got in the flow of things, but I definitely will say, you know, like, Um, making sure I have like the things I needed in my cart because the last thing you want to do is arrive at a patient room and then like forget oh no like I I forgot a dumbbell or I forgot you know the reacher I wanted to use for my session so just kind of having like a more prepared mind um, going into it was definitely an adjustment for me um, different from field work and now like working in a pandemic yeah yeah and I can definitely understand that because I know I was um, also working in the pandemic when it first started. And mm-hmm. it was uh, definitely, um, I would say, a little shocking for us because it was something new and we had to adjust very quickly to it. Um, mm-hmm. And sadly to say, we just had so many people passing from it and it made it that much harder. Um, yeah. Because, you know, um, I was working in a facility for a while, so I had really good relationships with patients that weren't, wasn't even on therapy. So mm. just to see um, some of the patients that wasn't, was no longer on therapy, struggling with COVID and, you know, eventually losing the battle was, was tough. So I think, um, too, for, you know, um, new grads that's coming in into the pandemic, you kind of want to, and if you're going, especially if you're going into a skilled nursing facility, you kind of want to wrap your mind around you may lose somebody if you get that COVID, you know? So how is life um, doing the teletherapy? Yeah, um, it is. Well, I I also just wanted to quick add uh, something else I learned treating in the pandemic is because we're wearing the mask and like all the PPE, um, patients would get confused, especially if you're PRN, like I'm PRN. And so they are like, who is this person? (laughs) Um, so, uh, and they can't see you smile, you know, that's like part of encouraging to like smiling. Um, so just being more vocal about like, you know, you're, you know, just saying things and encouraging them. And I also recommend maybe even having uh, a whiteboard. I have a whiteboard and like a little, you know, uh, marker for 
patients who are hard of hearing and like the mask kind of like, you know, is oh, difficult so for them to hear. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I can just like write like simple steps. Um, so I just want to, yeah, <laughs> like that's, that's, definitely that's things that I call. learned. <laughs> you know, I was looking at the news and I was looking at some nurses and they had something really cool. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's, that's actually a good idea. They actually yeah. were so, because in the hospitals, there's so much more decked out than, than mm-hmm. we are. Yeah. Um, and they, you really could not see their face at all. And they actually had a picture, like a really big picture that kind of covered oh, their chest of themselves. So when so they would smart. walk to treat people, even though the, you couldn't really see their face because they had all this stuff on, they had like a picture of them smiling, saying, hi, my name is underneath their picture. So I thought that was, that was nice trying to bring back a little bit of that interpersonal relationship. So that was, that yeah. was really cool. And actually, I hope that uh, throwing that out there into the world, tips, um, that could even be something that we can do too for our patients because, you know, it's right now, it just feels like it's a sad time, especially with them not being able to really interact. Yes. Um, You know, the ones coming in for the hospital, they're probably still going into the 14. I don't know if you guys are doing that, but I know we were doing a 14-day quarantine automatic. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And yeah. I, because I'm at home, um, recovering from a back surgery, so I haven't been working for a little bit. So I'm just checking with you to see how it's still going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That 14 day quarantine and them, you know, being isolated, it definitely, you see the emotional impact it, um, it has on patients. So, yeah. you know, you, you definitely have to just, you know, the empathy, the, the encouraging the kindness game like has to always be up to par because you know at the end of the day like we can leave you know they can't so it's just you know the patients patients definitely like if you thought you had patients like get 500 more dosage of it you know just for them you know it just because it's it's tough it's really tough right so then going back again, or I should say going forward to how, how is life with um, the teletherapy doing pedi- pediatrics that way? Yeah. So again, really different because I was used to uh, going into um, at my field work, going into their homes and, uh, you know, delivering services that way, um, pretty much just in person. Um, but this time, uh, because of the pandemic, you know, I've been doing some virtual sessions and it, at first it was an adjustment. You know, I called up some classmates uh, who uh, were pediatric therapists um, that were, you know, in person and, you know, they switched to telehealth for a little bit. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, you know, how, how was that? Like, you know, what's that like? What do, you know, how, how do you work on handwriting when you're not physically there? Right. And so it, it really was, um, you know, getting creative, uh, Zoom and other like different features, you know, you can use your mouse pad. Um, and I think I like I use that a lot to help them like with the fine motor control. And then I kind of see like it's almost like a step to handwriting. So that way they can really focus visual motor mm-hmm. um, wise with like some of the things that they're doing and then translate it on paper. So it's like you know, obviously, like working, you know, we get to use the computer and work on stuff on the computer, but uh, having them also translate things on paper and, and, but it is kind of cool, like, because I get to ask them, like, you know, what do you think about your handwriting? What do you see that you're doing right? What do you see that you need a little bit more help with? And they're able to identify a little bit more. So I definitely see some advantages with the, um, with the Zoom sessions, just being more creative with that. Um, you know, it, it definitely, I, I feel as though the students feel like it's a more partnership um, than, you know, them thinking it's like another teacher telling them what to do, you know, like, okay. um, so it, you know, when they participate, and when, you know, they get to do some things um, during the session, I, I can kind of sense like, oh, you know, like they, you know, now they get to be a part of this. Um, so, but yeah, it, it's, it was tough, you know, like the technical difficulties, um, you know, sometimes like, you know, they may not be prepared for a session, (laughs) like, you know, and I I wonder too, like, how does that work with kids that might have like CP or autism that can't just relate or express themselves or kids that have Asperger's? I'm, I'm assuming that the parents are are sitting right there with the child during the session, but 
How mm-hmm. is that working? How is it that? Yeah. That? So I, so for me, I know the, the students that I have are um, moderate to higher level um, on, excuse me, with um, autism spectrum disorder. But, um, you know, a couple of kids that I do have that are younger and also, um, you know, have higher needs, uh, the parent um, is there and throughout the whole session, providing those physical cues and like me telling them, um, you know, just some tips to, uh, you know, like tips to work on or, um, you know, how to cue them. But it, it, that parental, um, you know, presence is definitely vital uh, for patients that um, have higher needs because, you know, just facilitating a, an OT session over Zoom with a patient with uh, those types of needs, I mean, without the parent would be, I think, in my opinion, would be incredibly difficult, if not nearly impossible. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so it, it definitely does welcome a more uh, relationship, like a chance to have a more relationship with the parents now that they're, you know, they have to be even more involved, you know, setting up the, yeah, setting up the Zoom, um, scheduling the services, all this other stuff, they're there, um, relaying information to them. Oh, oh, I'm going to drop you off and I'll be back to pick you up. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So they, so I think it's even helpful that they even get to really see what's going on in therapy. Um, And so that, you know, I never would have thought that uh, would be such a, huge uh benefit with you know the pandemic and virtual sessions because you know at first I'm like I uh you know like (laughs) I've only ever treated you know uh in person this is this is I don't know but it's it's been going really well Yeah. yeah and I think this pandemic has really forced in a sense um OTRs even called us to kind of think out of the box and um, to allow us to kind of branch into different things using the virtual system Mm -hmm. um, and just evolving in a profession, you know, and that's staying within the norms of, you know, again, skilled nursing and, you know, uh, what's it called? Uh, Pediatrics, but we're actually starting to branch into a little bit more of the mental health doing different services. And, Mm -hmm. you know, so I think it's promoting uh, creativity. Um, I think, I believe that tends to happen whenever we're going through something or we're going through a hardship, it kind of makes you kind of sit down and really think about what can I do to survive and keep going. I think this was absolutely a beneficial conversation for not just um, new grads, but for just people having questions and wanting to know how, um, you know, if I'm thinking about going into the profession, how the profession may be right now. So, mm-hmm. I mean, MJ, do you have any tips or any advice you want to leave for the folks before we uh, close off? Um, yeah, one, uh, definitely, like, if you're in that phase where you're taking the NBCOT exam, um, you know, you got this. I, if I could do it, you could do it. (laughs) Um, You know, I definitely feel like it is a challenge, but you know, all the things that you learned in school, you're, you're funneling it all together. Um, You know, just, you know, have a study schedule, stick with it. And just remember, it's just a small sacrifice right now, just buckling down, um, you know, make sure as well as the content, you're really reviewing how to answer and dissect the question. Um, and then for those that are about to, you know, get their first job or get, you know, go into the interview, um, just continue to be confident, continue to think of different ways you can, um, you know, uh, advocate for your profession. And, you know, I, I always, people are always so happy when, um, they're able to do the things that they used to do. Um, and, and they'll thank you for it. They thank me and they'll thank you. So I, I definitely feel like, um, you know, if you're at that phase, you're about to go in, confidence is key. You, you know it. Um, you know, you're, you're just, you're just gonna, you're just gonna do great. And don't be afraid to ask, you know, for help. Yeah. Uh, you know, I still ask for help and there's wonderful CODAs and OTRs and, um, PTs and, and whatnot. And I ask their opinion and stuff, but you know, at the end of the day too, you know, your things and yeah, you're, you're, you're going to do great. You're going to do awesome. 
So what does the future look like for MJ? Do you think you're going to continue with your education? Do you think you might branch into something a little bit new? What's the future look like for you? Yeah, I, I want to get a um, couple of certifications under my belt. I thought about uh, uh, hand therapy, okay. um, but uh, for right now, just, you know, um, you know, different modalities, just getting more of a, a, a handle on them and being more confident and knowledgeable about that. I really like um, uh, just because I love encouraging others and, and teaching. I'd love to, you know, uh, in the future, maybe be an adjunct professor or maybe okay. be in a classroom or, or speaking about, um, you know, whatever job I'm in that involves occupational therapy, just something, again, just pushing the profession and getting its name out there. Um, and I know right now, uh, you know, that for me, that looks like, you know, making funny, entertaining videos about um, occupational therapy on social media, you know, on my Instagram, it's just something fun, but also yeah. awareness, you know, it makes people know, like, oh, like, you know, that's what OT stands for. That's what OTs do. Right. So. Yeah. And I will, and I will for everybody that wants to know more about Miss MJ, I will put her social media information here as well um, on the video as well as in the description. So MJ, I want to thank you so much for just coming on and just having like a general girl conversation with me. I greatly appreciate it, and I hope that for everybody that's watching this, I hope it's beneficial. Please be sure to like, share, and subscribe. Um, comment below. All right. Thank you so much, MJ. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Take care. <laughs> Bye.